Hello and welcome. His distinctive voice has graced some of the best-known pop songs since the 1970s, but he keeps a low profile in the media as he focuses on creating his music. This week on One on One, meet British singing and songwriting star Paul Carrick. Since writing that first hit for his group Ace in 1975, the singer and multi-instrumentalist born in Northern England has been associated with some of the top bands of the past 30 years, including Squeeze and Roxy Music. But it was his soulful voice on a 1989 Mike and the Mechanics number one hit that resonated with a global listening audience. In 2008, Paul Carrick released the ironically titled I Know That Name, reminding people that he may stay out of the spotlight most of the time, but he still has a lot to offer. Paul, I'm delighted to have a chance to chat with you. It's my pleasure. Of course, your, your voice is known by millions of people, but a lot of people looking at you will be saying, oh, I don't know that face necessarily. Does it ever frustrate you to be so well known as a voice, I mean, and so well known as a musician among especially your peers, but sometimes, you know, people will be like, I can't connect the face and the voice. Not really, no. I mean, um, I do consider myself to be very fortunate to have had a great time, a great life, and uh, a career in music. You know, I started out from very humble beginnings without much of an idea what I was doing, and somehow or other I've managed to survive in the music business and um, been involved with some great people and great things and had a little success along the way. So. It can be a little frustrating, but um, on balance, no, I consider myself very fortunate. And you even called your 2008 album, I Know That Name. Yeah. If, for example, you're at dinner and someone said to me, OK, three lines in three different songs that you have sung that I might know, which three <laughs> lines would you pick? How long has this been going on? <laughs> okay. Would be number one. That's, uh, that was my first claim to fame, really. It's one of the first songs I wrote, and that's going back to 1974. In the Living Years would be another, and Over My Shoulder probably be another one. So there we've got three, three names, of course, of songs that people will say, OK, right, that was the guy whose voice it was. Now, I know that the, you've been, you know, uh, listed in, in uh, music guides as, uh, as your, at least your style as pop, and a name I find, or a title I find intriguing, Blue-Eyed Soul. That's almost like saying a white man who sings black man's music. Well, I mean, I grew up, one of my main influences as a kid, um, I mean, first off, it was bands like The Shadows and then The Beatles and the whole Mersey Boot. Thing, but in my teens, soul music and uh, Motown, um, all those great singers and uh, and songwriters. That that's what that was the music of the times. I was I played in the, the local soul band. In fact, I sold my drums because I started off as a drummer. I sold the drums in order to join the local soul band and play keyboards. I couldn't play, but I taught myself, and so that's had a major influence on me. As a singer, I don't question it. I'm not a music analyst, you know, but it's, it seems to be a natural way that I, when I approach a song, it, it seems to be in that kind of style. So, born in Sheffield in, uh, in, in North England, in the north of England, in yes. Yorkshire, what was it like in the 1950s? Yeah, I think it was, it was great, as I remember. My childhood uh, was, was very happy one. I mean, I think it was very austere. Um, growing up in post-war Britain, Sheffield, working-class town, I had a mixture of, of uh, influences, really, because my mum was from the sort of nitty-gritty part of central Sheffield, which was pretty tough and a lot of uh, industry and stuff like that going on. But I grew up, actually, on the outskirts of Sheffield, in much more of a village kind of atmosphere, fresh air, and a lot of freedom. As kids, we were played out on the streets all the time, and we were told there may be danger out there, but we weren't really... Um, conscious of, of that, we had a lot of freedom and uh, it was a great time. A lot less complicated, I think, than, than these days. Tell me about your parents, how they influenced you, the, the kind of role they played in your life. Uh, both very hard working, as I say, working class. I grew up, um, they were shopkeepers actually. We had a corner shop that sold paint and wallpaper. And my dad w was a painter and decorator. 
and uh, he always seemed to have a car with a roof rack and ladders on the top and which we'd take off when we went anywhere posh but uh, both very hard working determined to you know make life better for us all um, my father particularly was the musical influence and his family had s some um, musical connections and my aunts played piano my grandmother played piano and uh, in the attic above the shop where we lived I found some bits of old drum kit and that's kind of how I got started playing along would you believe to wind up gramophone <laughs> and bashing these bits of old drum kits and it, and it was around the time the Mersey beat was really taking off, the, the influence of people like the Beatles as well, I guess, soon after yeah, that. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I was always interested in music and uh, wherever I could get it, you know, it wasn't so much around in those days, you know, the radio. If you heard a pop record on, it was quite something. But um, it was before the, even the Beatles, it was bands like The Shadows, and um, I had an elder brother who played guitar, and uh, he would bring home all, all, all kinds of records and blues records, soul records. And uh, of course, when the Beatles happened and the whole Mercy Beat thing, then I got bitten very badly by the musical bug, and that was it. That was I, there was no looking back really. What was sort of, I mean, apart from the shadows, you were talking about the kind of music there. What sort of influence did you look for? I mean, you were saying music was hard to find, but what did you listen to as uh, as, a, as a youngster then? Well, as I say, whatever I could get really. Um, I know even in our in the yard where we lived, there were other kids and uh, older kids and they had records by people like Buddy Holly and Elvis Presley, Tommy Steele, so uh, it was great to get, get your hands on them. But uh, as I say, once the Beatles uh, hit and the, the whole excitement, of course we all thought that they invented music, and um, so I, I would bash along to these, this bit of drum kit that I had, playing along to, to records by Jerry and the Pacemakers and the Searchers and all the bands. And you never had any music lessons of any kind? No, no, so whatsoever. No. All self-taught? Absolutely, it shows. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, well no, achieved quite a lot. I've always had very good ears, you know, musical ears. And um, I think as a kid, I, I, I sang, you know, um, at, at school, and people picked up on the fact that I could sing. But um, the actual uh, instruments, drums, guitar, keyboards, no, I, I've taught myself. Do you remember the first time going up in front of a live audience as a band? I do I actually remember playing uh, the, wood, the woodwork teacher's wedding and they had a whip round and we got 28 shillings I think for that but actually probably before that I played at school at the school concert and uh, we did four Beatles songs and the kids there in the audience all played their part by screaming and throwing jelly babies at us and you were on drums presumably at that time were you? that's right yeah so, uh, as I say, I was smitten by then. And, of course, I saw the Beatles play live in, in Sheffield, in, in the City Hall. And then you moved on to doing local pubs and, and clubs as well, didn't you? Yeah, I, I, as I say, I joined the local soul band. And um, I think we, we came to London. We came overnight, slept in the van to audition for a gig in Germany. A residency, which is what all the other bands seem to be doing. This is what we, I mean, that's, this sounded like a bit of an adventure. So we came down to London, auditioned, got past this audition, and literally the next day we're off to Germany for um, a month. You were in Hamburg? Yeah. Actually, our first stop was Frankfurt. Okay. But uh, we did the Hamburg thing as well, but Frankfurt and, and Cologne, we played for hours and hours a night, and this was the, our grounding and how we, you know, got to learn our trade, really. I mean, to what degree did that set you up for what became later a life on the road? Well, yeah, this is, this is very much the beginning of it. And, I, I, you know, it was very hand-to-mouth, I've got to say. But uh, for us, it was, a, you know, an, a, an adventure. How did you, um, at that time, keep optimistic that you'd get a chance to get a break and, and really... I mean, you were saying living hand-to-mouth at that time. What, yeah. what, what gave you the optimism? We didn't really think in terms of having a break, actually. We just thought it was just playing and playing gigs and that whole thing and meeting girls and uh, having fun. That was as far as our ambitions went, I think. We didn't even dream of you know, making records and stuff till later. And your, you, presumably your studies had to be sort of put to one side as you went off uh, on this musical. Studies? <laughs> no. I, I, actually, I was absolutely hopeless at school. I've never been very academically minded. I left school at 16. In fact, the van was waiting at, at school when I was taking my GCE, GCSEs or whatever, yeah, GCEs. Yeah. GCEs all the time, sure. I took an exam in the morning. I had one in the afternoon. I came out at lunchtime and the boy said, no, we're going to Scotland. We've got to go now. So that was it. How did your parents react? Yeah, I think they were kind of shocked, but they didn't really know what I was um, 
going to do with myself. We, we had the shop, but uh, I didn't fit into that. And I just knew what I wanted to do. And it was, I wanted to be one of those guys that went off in a van down the road. How do you think the losing your father at 11 had an impact on the way you saw life after that? Massively, massive blow, you know, uh, a real blow. Because I did love him to bits. He was a fantastic guy. And it's a real massive shock. And it takes a long time to get over. And I don't think you probably ever do, you know, it, it, it does stay with you. But these days, I suppose there are so many kids who, you know, um, brought up in single f parent families and, and all, the, all the rest of it. So it's not so unusual, but uh, it was a big shock and it was a big heartbreak. And um, I think in a way it kind of influenced my, me musically in, in, in a number of ways because I tend to lean to that melancholy uh, thing and I have a root, a, a, a well <laughs> of, of stuff that I can draw on. What about the way it's affected your, your relationship to your, with your children? Well, I was very keen to survive and be there for them. And um, it, it, my number one priority in life, apart from surviving as a musician or an artist, has been to provide a stable uh, uh, a background as I possibly could for my kids. We're going to look at where the turning point came, where the, the career on the road living hand to mouth changed in just a moment. Okay. So more questions with Paul Carrick when we return with One on One. Welcome back. You're watching One on One. We're speaking with English singer, songwriter and musician Paul Carrick. And you actually had quite a, a peripatetic uh, career in the sense that you moved around a lot between bands, <laughs> to, use a, <laughs> to use a big word. Um, I mean, from Ace, Squeeze, Mike and the Mechanics, and actually the lists, when people, if someone goes online and looks at who you've played with, what you've done, it's been quite amazing. Why do you think you've moved around so much in the music business? Um, because opportunities have presented themselves and I'm not very good at saying no, basically. I mean, um, it, people can get the wrong impression that, you know, you, you, you maybe you're a mercenary or not very good with people. I'm the opposite, actually. I, I like to get on with people. I think, really, I've been a member, a full-on member of maybe four bands, I would say, Ace, Squeeze, Mike and the Mechanics, and a band I had with Nick Lowe for about four years. But um, in between this, um, the phone would occasionally ring and people would say, could you just come down and we just need a little bit of keyboards. It won't take you half an hour. Okay, uh, uh, will I get paid? Maybe not, but you know. So there's been a lot of, lot, lot of that. And, and, and I actually saw um, a lot of those things, playing on sessions with different people as a way of just learning and, and progressing as a musician. Of course, things changed a lot since you first had an interest. You've had a, a good sort of f almost four-decade career from when you first started in, in, in the music business. How do you regard the new world of downloads and, and you know, everything being much more digital and online and very different from sticking an album? Yeah, very there? different, very different. But, you know, it, it's, it's all good, I think. You know, it's the way things are going. I mean, we, we have our own uh, website and, and you can download uh, our stuff because for the last 10 years, I basically had my own small label That's and right. been operating as a, as a as a cottage industry really yeah, from this very fed up, studio. Yeah, you fed up with the, the big, big sort of uh, music label approach. Eh? Well, it didn't really work for me. I mean, I've had some of the benefits of it over the years, particularly with the bands I've been involved with that, you know, from the, um, the clout that the major record labels had back then. But to me, the writing was on the wall and it was about 10 years ago, there was a, a real sea change where I just wanted to start making records that, that I was proud of and I didn't want any outside interference and I wasn't too bothered if they were that successful as long as you know we ticked over and things were... And I was still doing what I wanted to do, which is to make new, mu new music, new records and to play live. And this is after you released uh, Beautiful World in 1997, that's yes. when things went independent, yeah. Well, I'd had some problems with my, my record company in England, um, having had a big pep talk saying, yeah, Paul, get in there and do a new album. I, I, I came with this new album, Beautiful World, and in the interim, um, the whole staff had changed at the record company. And of course, they all had their own agendas and their own uh, flags to fly. And I said, oh, thanks very much, but uh, we're not really interested. So that's, that was the sea change. And I started to write an album called uh, Satisfy My Soul right here in the studio. And as I say, it was an album I wanted to produce myself. 
and um, started looking into taking one step further, which was to just market it and distribute it uh, in a small way. There is a difference between critical acclaim, which you've had tons of with all your, your fantastic work, and commercial success. How do you balance doing the things you love, as you've, you've explained here, and still making it work commercially for you? Well, somehow I've survived this far. And um, as I say, disregarding that, but for, for the last 10 years, it's been a very small cot a cottage industry. And, um, but it's a lovely feeling of independence. I, I love that feeling that we're not beholden to, um, you know, accountants and executives. We just get on with what we do and we're supported by the fans, really. And that, that, that's it. So, but I'm at the stage now where my main criteria in life is to enjoy what I've, what I've got already, you know, and enjoy my music, really. That's, that's the main thing. Of course, a lot of people got to know, know you and know your voice from the work with Mike and the Mechanics. Yeah. Uh, I was a big Genesis fan, so of course yeah. I was automatically following Mike uh, Rutherford's work. Um, and in, uh, you did Silent Running, um, uh, The Living Years. These sure. became huge hits. Uh, and people know these across the world. Now, in 2000, uh, July 2000, uh, your fellow Mike and the Mechanics uh, singer, Paul Young, died he did indeed. Uh, of a heart attack. He was still 53 years old, still yeah. young. You guys said you weren't going to tour after that, and then changed your mind. What was the reason? To, to be honest, I, I wasn't very comfortable about continuing as we were, because basically it was just Mike and myself left. But... Um, yeah, I think Mike convinced me that you know we'd we'd worked hard to establish ourselves and that people enjoyed the music and then we should continue. So we did. We got together and we made a, a an album and we did a few shows um, supporting. We went on tour with Phil Collins and and um, and it was fine. It was it was good. People uh, accepted it, but it you know it obviously was not going to be the same. I mean, Paul was a major part of the band and uh, a great performer a very popular performer, so I, I, I felt it was that we should leave it. And of course you're doing a lot of your own work by this time. In May 2001, you filled out the Royal Albert Hall as a first time as a solo performer. That That's must right. have been quite something. Well, it's always been my favourite venue, and I've played there with many times with different bands, And uh, but I, for this time we thought we'd push the boat out. It was my 50th birthday, and uh, so we thought we'd, we'd make a thing of it. And. Uh, we did fill out the Albert Hall, but I, as I said, I did have the support of a lot of my friends. Mike came down, and the guys from Squeeze, B.A. Robertson, Nick Lowe. We had uh, so many people. It was great. It was a good party. I know in 2003, you finally got together with Ringo Starr. He'd been trying to get you to, to play with him a couple of times, I know. And you finally got together and did the Ringo Rama tour. I did Tell indeed. me about that. Well, it was a big treat for me, being a major Beatles fan. And uh, something Ringo has done for many years is to put a band together um, to go on tour and so he can have fun and be Ringo basically to play the drums and um, so he puts it together a different lineup each year basically each member of the band needs to have three hits because we take it in turns at singing and um, he I had been approached a couple of times before to do it and I hadn't been able to because of other commitments but um, yeah I got to I got to go on tour with him and it was absolutely fantastic Really, a blast. We spoke about your early childhood and the people who influenced you early on, uh, the shadows and so on, but what happened in later years? Who, who did you listen to, or at least get influenced by musically, uh, once you'd been playing for quite a while yourself? Was there anyone? I've got so many favourites, I don't know where to start really, but you know, people like Donny Hathaway, Marvin Gaye. Um, all the, these are ones that have been with, you know, with me all the way through, you know, people that I've, whose records I know inside out. Um, not a lot of new music, I must Very admit. So I'm, I'm not great at that. You know, I, I hear occasionally I'll hear something that really I like. Um, I'm, I think recently things like Fleet Foxes. I love that band, the Fleet Foxes. And Who has influenced you outside the music career as a mentor? Who have you looked up to? Well, certainly. I mean, I, had an, uh, I have an L elder brother, four years older than me, and, and when this uh, tragedy happened of, of losing our father, at 15, he took over really as the as the head of the family, you know, and he started to um, run the shop. And um, he's been a fantastic influence on me. He was very much like my father, uh, whereas I'm much more like my mom, who's far more cautious. But my whole extended family of uh, 
aunts and uncles and grandparents who were so supportive all the way through uh, have probably been the biggest influence on it. Is it tough being on the road? You have, you have a family, you're very close to them. Yeah, um, it's, it's easier now. It was very tough when I had four young kids growing up. It was tough for my wife as well, because when we, made, uh, when we would tour America, for instance, the minimum we would go away for would be six or seven years. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, that's a long that's stretch. A long stretch. <laughs> the minimum we go away for would be... They recognise you when you come back. <laughs> the minimum would be six, seven weeks, you know, and that's a long time to be away from home in, in, at that time. So now, my mostly what I do is concentrated on the UK and I'm, I get home most nights anyway. Is there anything you, you've set aside long-term and short-term, Paul, that you'd like to do? Any kind of uh, projects that you've, you've been wanting to get your teeth into? Uh, yeah. I must admit, I'll confess, I, I have this album that I love by Joni Mitchell called Both Sides Now. If, if you haven't heard it, you must get it. And it's all orchestrated. And uh, Joni, she does a lot of um, classic songs and some of her own songs reworked just with the orchestra. And, it, and it's just lovely. It's, a, it's one of the few albums I can put on and just thoroughly enjoy. So it was always an ambition to do something like that and that's kind of what I'm doing at the moment. I'm, I'm, I'm working on an album, as I say, with an orchestra, David Cullen, very famous uh, uh, orchestral arranger, is doing the arrangements and we'll be doing some classic songs with my interpretation of them and some of my own songs reworked. If uh, you were to leave behind some kind of legacy you'd like, what would you, how would you like people to remember you? Number one, I want them to think that I did a decent job bringing up my kids. I did, you know, it's a tough job, and uh, I hope I've done a decent job there. Musically, I think I'll have, um, I mean, who cares? <laughs> but I don't think I've done what I can do yet, and I still am striving all the time to do better work. So if it, if it ended tomorrow and they said, well, he was the guy that sang How Long the Living Years, I wouldn't be too shabby coming from where I have come from. But I honestly really think I've got some better work to do yet. And that's what keeps me going. Well, I'll be listening out for it, Paul. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks. Cheers. Cheers.